Alrighty, it's 11.01 and we're rolling. Let's see what we get. I'm doing some maintenance coding today and I also have some fussing with uh, stuff to do, like popping out the chat and throwing it on my stream as I want to do. Let me just get that ready. Always requires a little update. There it is. So I don't know who's dropped by, but uh, we are waiting for a firewood to be delivered. That's going to be a lot of today for me. I have firewood coming, so uh, for perhaps a fairly sizable chunk of this week, I'm going to be carrying it around. And fortunately, I didn't actually run out. In fact, I so much didn't run out that let me go and throw a log on the fire. Before I get into my total um, deep dive on maintenance coding, I've got some stuff. Well, let's smoke into the room. That's bad. Oh, now. Curled the uh, temperature sensor around. So, guys, bear with me. This is more important than coding. nothing burns. If I do this wrong, things burn. So, and guess what? Hey, we're starting right up with the firewood being delivered. So I'm going to try to set this in a place where you'll be able to hear it. I got to go attend to that now. All right, check this out.
And that there is the sound of the uh, gate of the thing smashing. Alrighty, and I gotta go put my car back in the driveway. And once I'm finished with that, I have a lot of firewood to carry today, but I also have some coating stuff to do. So we'll be looking at that momentarily. This shouldn't take me too long.
already. Okay. So that was only about 10 minutes. That's not so bad. And yes, indeed, that was firewood being delivered. Although I still have a lot of firewood carrying to do, I can chill out a little bit now because that was the hard part. At least in the sense of having to go attend to it and deal with uh, the person showing up, giving me a receipt for it and all that kind of stuff. Might be a bit of a tiring day, but you know, I've actually invented a special way of dealing with that, which is I have a uh, they ask you to put a garbage can in the driveway where you want the firewood dropped, which kind of seems dumb because I parked my car in a place where there's a, a blank space in the snow now, and I'm like, yeah, put it there. But they do want the trash can there. And I have one that I stopped using as a trash can and started using as a firewood hauling can because um, I ran a heavy strap such as one would use for tying down loads on semi-trailers. This big orange thing I got at a Mr. G's industrial surplus place. And I ran it through where the handle of the trash can used to go after having torn the handle of the trash can out. So it makes it so it's a trash can, like big giant size trash can with wheels. It's one of those semi-rectangular ones, round wrecked ones with uh, wheels on. And on the near side where the wheels are, where the handle would have been, there's this big strap. And so I run the strap through where the handles used to go and then I can run it over my shoulder, meaning that I can fill the trash can with pieces of wood, slide it along on a surface like the floor indoors by rolling it partially on the wheels, which saves a little wear and tear on the bottom of the trash can and on the floor. And when I need to lift it up steps, like getting stuff into the house, I can crunch down a little bit and lift with my shoulders. And so strenuous is this activity that I have torn the heavy plastic trash can apart through the lifting forces I have to apply to get the damn thing up and over each respective step that I have to lift it up, which gives you some idea of how heavy all this is. So I have that to do all day long. But it's super bright and sunny outside, meaning that it's not going to rain on this firewood. So I can just leave it sitting there for the time being. And there's plenty of it sitting on top of the pile. So even if stuff like sitting in piles of snow is going to soak up the snow at some point, um, I can bring like wood off the top of the pile into the closer firewood stacks I have indoors. So I'm not going to have to deal with trying to make a fire with wet soaking wood. And these are the things like if that happened, I would be screwed for months practically. So that's why I have to deal with this stuff as it happens. So yeah, that's most of my attention. I will say there's other things on my attention. That's chai tea, not coffee. I had to stop drinking as much coffee because I was stressing myself out super bad. One of the things that's stressing me out is dealing with the Big Sur situation where I have to set up an entirely new computer or possibly buy one in order to run the version of Xcode that can compile for Big Sur slash M1 Macintoshes. And in 
doing, I have Big Sur running on another machine and I have uh, the newest version of Xcode on that machine and I cannot compile my plugins on it. I have put out a call for help and offered to pay them to somebody I know that develops like frameworks for, it's an alternate framework to Juice. And the guy seems very clever and very on top, Oli Larkin, he seems very clever and very on top of all of this kind of stuff. So I've asked him, can I like pay you to set me up a template or something that is a gain plugin, just gain one control and you multiply it by the amount in audio unit format that is set up to build on the newer machine because I can't make mine do it. So I need a whole new build and I am ill suited to figure that stuff out. In so doing, I need to set up a Apple developer account more than just having reserved the um, manufacturer ID such as you had to do back in like 2006 and earlier. And I have tried to do that and have gotten nowhere. So I'm probably going to have to call for Apple support to set up this developer account, which apparently is the most normal thing in the world, but it ain't working for me. It's not letting me log into a developer account. So I have to solve that. And I have another plan, which is I've got a machine that's dedicated to like graphic arts. It's actually, a, it said there's a Cintiq and a, a relatively new Mac Mini, which is another thing that I could have run Big Sur on, but I decided not to. Because I've been meaning to fool with that, and that's something I could add on a different day. Um, any of this stuff, when I talk about live streaming, like the stream that I did in order to make the weird little jam that I used... First of all, I was trying far too hard. And second of all, I have to chill that stuff out. I had like lights and stuff going on and it was hard to see what I was doing. And I was kind of trying to be entertaining. And by the time I was done, I was just beat into the ground. It was no good. So um, the live streaming that I do is going to be, I think, a little bit more like this uh, this morning. In as... Um, you know, I went off for 10 minutes to deal with firewood being delivered and the live stream just kept going. It needs to be a little more like that. It needs to be less like, oh, this is the entertaining flashing of lights and stuff. And more like, yeah, just watch over my shoulder as I do things, okay? That's how things have to be going forwards. Otherwise, I'll just burn out and have to stop doing it again. And uh, winter is always a tough time. So that's basically how that rolls. And uh, whether people have comment, I need to set the chat to live chat. I'm looking at top chat. That's not what it needs to be. Boop. There we go. Welcome to live chat. Let me check and make sure that that's still working. Boop. Yeah, it's still working. Yep. So that's how that works. Oh, I forgot to mention how I might or might not have gotten the A10 Mini working in a consistent way. Because the thing is, that's also a nightmare of fresh hell for me today. It has basically stopped working reliably. It's the only way I can have these multiple camera things or bring the laptop video in and overlay a camera over it. But sometime a couple of weeks ago, it just went dead, black screen. If any of you are using an A10 Mini for this kind of stuff, this is going to be useful information. Otherwise, it's not, so I will. But um, they are, in their way, handy for people who are like one-man live streaming operations, if that's something you wanted to do. But there's a catch. And the catch is, at least on the versions of macOS I'm using, There are days when OBS just doesn't see the video. And if you set up an audio input, you would see that it saw the audio coming from the ATEM. And if you run its little control panel, 
where you can adjust all of the colors and things, and it's really very wonderful as far as that's concerned. It can see that just fine too. But the webcam part of it can't see the computer. And the reason is, as near as I can work out, and it's been many months of trying to figure this one out too, sometimes I feel like literally everything that I'm trying to do is a pile of decaying and collapsing garbage. Um, what you're seeing right now is it not being garbage. It is in fact working, but when it stops working, it's because it is not looking for the webcam source for some reason. And what you do is you plug in any other webcam source, doesn't matter what it is. I'm plugging in the old uh, Thunderbolt HDMI to computer converter. It's a Thunderbolt intensity something. And for a long time I was running that and running the ATEM HDMI out directly to that. So I was going through two stages for no good reason, even though it was supposed to be able to talk through USB-C. Well, this time it that died and the USB-C came alive. And I went, huh? That's weird. And then the USB-C died as well, and I didn't know what to do. And I found out about this webcam thing, where you poke it by plugging in another webcam, and then it looks for and finds the correct one. And it worked once, and then it failed, and then it worked again, and then it failed. And now I'm beginning to think there is a detailed sequence of turn on, where what you got to do is you have the ATEM Mini plugged in, by USB-C and you plug in the uh, other e webcam, like the Intensity Shuttle, Thunderbolt, whatever. It has to go through an adapter because the USB, in the Intensity Shuttle Thunderbolt needs to plug into a Thunderbolt port, which the new machine does not have. And then you power on the ATEM and only then do you turn on the camera plugged into input one of the ATEM, and only then does USB, uh, OBS, sorry, not USB, only then does OBS see any of this, which is what it's doing right now. And that's what I did this morning, and I didn't spend five tries trying various things. Oh no, adding a new source in OBS doesn't help at all. I have spent hours upon hours doing that. It doesn't help at all. What it needs is to trick the firmware of the A10 Mini, which is updatable, but they haven't fixed the problem. You need to trick the firmware into showing itself to OBS. Until then, you've got nothing. You don't even have the input source. You've got blank nothing. And OBS sees and comprehends nothing whatsoever. So yeah, so, you know, months where all of this pile of gear is behaving itself for a good months. Months when everything is blowing up in my face uh, one after another are bad months. And we'll see how all this holds together. I honestly could see trying to get some kind of gamer grade, like video gamer run your uh, PlayStation into the computer to stream kind of deal. I do need to go into the computer because I need to use OBS for things like overlaying chat. Not that many people are chatting in chat, but uh, there were things I was doing in OBS that was that were pretty interesting, and that could continue. But um, that's what sometimes gets. You'll, you'll wind up having like Bobo Chris the Idiot dunce on stream times because there are times when the piles of these things piling up and needing to be fixed get so overwhelming that my brain just shorts out and can't work. What if I add a new source to Nobia? Yep. Yeah, that's that's the thing is I might end up just... You see, the thing... The thing about, I could just use the HDMI output of the ATEM. The, AT, the ATEM can switch cameras, and it can switch them on a timer, which is what I was doing for all the live streaming. And if I do more of the uh, 
composing stuff. And I absolutely intend to uh, do more of that because it, it feels like I should be able to do this. When it's hard, it's mostly because I'm overcomplicating it. It's not that hard to make like nice sounding stuff. It's not that hard to like play nice little chord progressions and things. And usually I'm just trying to make stuff way too complicated. So it could be easier and more fun to make music that's more approachable and nice sounding for people. Or I can just follow my like Zappa, Captain Beefheart, uh, Primus style thing and I'll make really ugly music that sucks. That's always good too. But um, I don't need to just stop live streaming. Which I did for months. Other than the coding stream. Yeah, LR flip timer is a one person's request. I don't know how to time it to the beat. I mean, you could, well, no, you couldn't because I don't have sidechain inputs working. I don't know how to time it to the beat. Sorry, I don't, I don't know how. And nobody is likely to tell me either. So you're kind of shut out of luck that way. Sorry, swearing, bad, bad thing to swear. And you could use LR flip timer on a wide track of some sort even though it's not perfectly clean as it transitions, but that's a disruptive kind of sound anyhow, so it might be just fine having that be that way. And yeah, if you're concerned about older webcams not working to force buyers to the market, yeah, just watch what Apple does these days. I'm hoping that my griping about Apple hasn't caused them, there's such a giant, humongous corporation that the, the chances of them getting mad at me personally for saying bad things is nil. There's no chance they even care about me. Although you never can tell because, you know, I've had a marquee client asking me to make stuff work on M1, which I can't do yet. So um, you never can tell who's watching. Anyways, let's do some of this. It's 1130. I'd like to go for another hour and a half or so. And there was something I wanted to do. I called it maintenance coding, maintenance AUs. I'd like to bring an older plugin into the world. I have done, uh, well, let's go over to this. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty typical. OBS, there I am. There's my screen. We should be all good. Yeah, before I get into this, um, another one of the things that I have hanging, but this is likely to be much less hanging, is that um, I have that graphic computer. When I say graphic computer, I mean it's the Mac Mini. It's plugged into a Cintiq because I was able to get one of those a while back. And I've been meaning to do stuff like, and you can ask about EQ coding. We'll talk about that in the next hour and a half. Um, I've been meaning to do stuff like do things in Blender and stream that because I thought that would be interesting and that hooks into my, you could call it egalitarian uh, motives. As you know, I'm not just about um, making plugins work on older computers so you don't have to buy new ones, although that's, I'm super committed to that. But I also am fascinated with cool stuff that people can use that doesn't cost them. And obviously, like, VCV Rack is an example of that. Although I can't get excited about it when I have an actual modular thing, because some of the stuff that you can do in the actual modular thing, there's no real parallel in VCV Rack because you can't just calculate everything on a sample-by-sample -sample basis. And in a DAW, if you have a buffer of one sample, which is effectively what VCV Rack, v -Rack has to do to function, then the efficiency of doing stuff goes way down. So 
it makes it really tough to do anything. And it makes it really tough to do non-trivial uh, modular setups. And you can do basic things. It's a really good, useful tool for learning how this stuff works. But the depth you can get into with a big pile of like analog circuitry is way gnarlier and hairier and funkier than you can possibly do, partly because VCV rack has to run on a sample by sample basis. It can't process in buffers like DAWs do. DAWs do, you know, like 128 to 256 samples at a time for each given thing. That means the computer gets to focus on one little chunk of sound and do that with all of its little internal variables and things. It doesn't have to bounce back and forth among all the different tracks as it's doing its thing. But in VCV, it has to bounce back and forth among all the different modules to know what its state is from one sample to the next. That's how it can do things like frequency modulation of parameters of other things. But this just kills a computer. It's not a good way to do a computer. So, uh, So the ones that interest me are more along the lines of, for instance, this, if I can move this around a little bit, I can get it to behave itself maybe. There we go. Yeah, that's good. This is a thing called Osmond. It says Osmond Coco. And there's a version of it that works on these really old machines. This is my coding laptop. And there's a version of it that works on my newest machine. And it is a printed circuit board designer. I haven't really learned how to use it, but um, learning how to do this is the kind of thing that can get you able to make circuit boards that you could send away for. And you spend like 50 bucks and get maybe 10 instances of whatever your design was and then put your parts on them and go. And that is very accessible, and that runs faster. But in terms of other kinds of stuff, it's things that would not work on this machine that you're currently seeing, but would work on the one, like I spent some of this morning uh, getting the one with the Cintiq um, up and working, and running its network cable I like twined the network cable along the power cables so it can sit out of the way, but then I can sit it in front of uh, another chair that's comfortable for me to sit on. And if I wear um, the headphones I used to use for Minecraft uh, streaming, which I could also run Minecraft on that Cintiq machine, I just need to run a separate mouse because it doesn't make any sense to do a touch screen on Minecraft like didn't really even make any sense when I had that on a phone. And it certainly doesn't make sense on the, the PC version. But I could be doing streaming off of that. And Blender is one of the programs that is accessible on that machine. You know, using Blender with a tablet is actually a pretty good way of doing it. It's a, a pretty fancy way of doing it, doing modeling that way and stuff. I would need to know how to do things like rigging in Blender to do the kinds of stuff that I want. But I have bought courses that teach you how to do that and not had time to watch them. But that is something where I could dive into that. However, there's a whole other side of things. Like I just showed you Osmond. Anybody can get Osmond. It's a free download. Um, anybody can get Blender. Blender is a free download. Back in the day, this is a number of, this is like, five versions ago at this point. Man, those people are working really hard. Um, back in the day, I got some kind of like tax over payment real estate thing or whatever. And this is a goodly number of years ago. And I decided I wanted to be able to learn how to do animation because it was always kind of interesting to me. And I found what I figured was the best program you could use for that and purchased a perpetual license for Harmony Premium 15. That's Toon Boom Harmony. 
and I've been too busy working with plugins to be able to use it. But it's a perpetual license. That's why I got a perpetual license. I was like, I will do this. I will learn how this particular version goes and I will keep it forever and love it and hug it and call it George. And then I'll keep a machine that will run it, like for instance, this one with the Cintiq. And it'll be like paper and pencil. As long as I have a machine that operates with this thing, it'll still be there. It'll still be the same as it was before. And I can gradually learn how to get better at it. Much like back in the day, I had a version of Photoshop. I started with like Photoshop 3 or something. It came on floppy disks. I'm not fooling. And I ended up learning that to the point that I was quite comfortable with it. And I knew it for years up until Adobe went uh, cloud only and charge you by the month only and I bailed on them. And I've never really connected that way with the art program since. But one thing that occurs to me, this occurred to me in the last week or so, I've been resisting doing streams of like learning to do animations and stuff in Toon Boom, even though I pay a lot of attention to animators and folks like that. And typically the ones that I'm paying attention to, you know, like Picapiti, Stylus Rumble, uh, Onion Skin, Crown Prince, they're working in Toon Boom. You know, some of, I've worked with some of those folks in conventions. I helped Crown Prince with a panel that she was giving in a convention. And I'd like to do that. I've been fascinated with that stuff for many, many years. And I think I've been resisting it because reasonably people can't have Toon Boom. I have a, a perpetual version of it because I got like $2,000 from some kind of tax overpayment thing years ago. And I was like, well, random windfall and like my housing and stuff and food is paid for. What shall I do with this? And rather than like get a modular synth back in the day, at the time I decided it would be good to be able to have Toon Boom on tap going on into the future for any time I needed it. Well, maybe the time is arriving. Because what I'm thinking is I've been looking for ways that I can do sort of chill streams. And certainly one of those is Minecraft, although I'm no longer sure I want to run a server that has people building on it because people tend to ask, well, what do you want me to build? And it's like, I don't want you to build anything. This is not how that game works. But um, one thing that struck me over the last week or so, in particular, like watching how I do stuff as well, the things that I watch, I find myself watching videos on stuff like the Moog one. I watch stuff I can't have. So it might not be so unreasonable to like, if I've got this and I don't feel that other people can reasonably have it, but I could stream it and I could try to pick up, you know, like do the kinds of stuff I'd be interested in doing with it, which are basically cartoony animation things. I think Warner Brothers were the greats. As, Warner Brothers and Disney were the greats as far as that kind of stuff was concerned. The sort of full animation style thing and the designs and things. That might be something worth doing. So as of now, I have that rig set up and literally capable of doing that and also running a mic in so that I could talk while I do it. I'm not sure how easy it would be to have chat visible, but you know, run it on another computer or something. I don't know. Figure out some way of doing it. But um, that said, that is also stuck because another technical problem. And the technical problem there is Toon Boom isn't like me. Toon Boom is not like an open source project or... It's, <laughs> I'm reminded of the trouble I got in trying to run Ardor. Because the thing with that is it's an open source project, but I can't run it now because I had to give my email in order to get a temporary license for being able to download a copy that mutes itself 
every 30 seconds because I didn't pay. And having deleted that, I could run it again, but now the download link has expired and the accessibility of it just freaks me out. The accessibility of that project just freaks me like, the, the stuff I got to do in order to get another version of it that mutes every 30 seconds. And I just put up zip files, man, that's my approach to the open source thing. So it's like, I guess not everybody works the same way as everybody else. And people want me to be saying nice things about Ardor. And I should. I love the fact that they're the open source thing that is the foundation for Harrison Mixbus. But... I'm tripping over the ability to use that stuff. By contrast, Reaper is incredibly cooperative. So, and Reaper is not open source. So it's all, you know, Reaper is more along the lines of free beer in that you can download the thing and it will just ask you every time you launch it. I have it on my virtual machine, you see, so I know. If I launch it in my Windows virtual machine that I build plugins on, then um, it asked me, you've run this 6,522 times. Would you consider buying a license? And I own several licenses already. I just haven't installed the license on that particular one because I'm kind of curious to see what will happen. And all that happens is it just keeps asking me nicely. Oh, so yeah, this is not actually free. You want to look into buying a copy or just ask me later and you click ask me later and it's like fine and it just lets you keep using it so that's all very complicated and the reason i bring it up is because toon boom is a full-on hardcore commercial licensing machine that makes you connect with the internet and all this kind of stuff and in order to move a copy of it over from the machine i'm streaming on which i had it on for a bit back to the cintiq where it belongs I have to return the license from the regular machine at their centralized servers and then, in, you know, reauthorize it on the other machine. And that part's probably going to be fine, but it won't let me return it. I'm running into an error. There's a bug. So I've asked, let me see, Oli Larkin, Apple for the developer account, and Toonboom to get back to me to please help problems that I'm having on stuff. And I'm waiting on three separate things at once. Plus I was waiting on firewood, but now I have my firewood. So forgive me. I'm going to tr see whether I can't look into a, uh, let's see, library, what shall we do? Oh, interesting. I'm looking for something that might be good. Um, right there. I might be a little more stuck than I expected. Yeah. I might be hunting for something that I don't know where it is. Let's see whether maybe I've got it in here somewhere. No? Well, we could do something else. I had in mind, well, here's what I can do. I cannot get anything programmed at all, but I can help Bo with his questions about EQ coding. You should start asking questions about EQ coding now. And while I do that, I'll show you this. This is the version of Purist Drive that my brother Dan set up. And this is the version of Purist Drive that shipped. Yeah, I know. Well, Styrian, that's the thing, is that um, 
What occurred to me was that I don't stick to watching only YouTube videos of stuff that I can do immediately. I spend most of my time in sort of aspirational zone. I want to see videos of like Yamaha CS80s and Moog 1s and things rather than a synthesizer I could reasonably get. Like I could reasonably get a Moog Sub Fatty. I literally did get a Moog Sub Fatty. I don't find myself hunting down videos on Moog Sub Fatty unless I'm literally trying to decide whether to get that particular one and you know what in that price range I can reasonably get. But when it's hanging out watching videos, it's like, no, that's the one I could have. I want to watch the video of the stuff that I can't have. So as far as, because it's confusing, it's like this whole business with wanting to animate, which is a very interesting thing to do, I got to say. It's an interesting exploit. Um, there's a lot to it. I have so many books on the subject. It's it's held my interest for many, many years. So some of that stuff I even know by heart now. It'll be interesting to see how that translates into me being able to actually do it when I don't really draw. But I'd like to animate um, more puppet-based rather than drawing, you know. Puppet Puppet-based is like what you used to do in Flash and still could in Adobe Animate, I suppose. And basically, the uh, thing that's held me up a little bit is that you can do some of these things with Grease Pencil in Blender. Like, you can do 2D animation in Blender now. And I think that's fascinating, and I think it's really compelling. And it's something that I have, and so I'm not super fat, like, Blender's a little daunting anyway. Blender does literally everything, so it's just straight up overwhelming. So, it's probably going to be Toon Boom, because Toon Boom is like the focus down on the particular things I'm interested in doing one. And as long as I can walk through enough of the things, there's, there's stuff that relates to to experiences in other programs, like uh, the Toon Boom node system is only accessible in the like $2,000 version that I bought many years ago, and all subsequent versions have only made that better. But you know, nodes are also in uh, Blender, so the general concept holds, and nodes are in a lot of other things too. So there would be some translation to it. Now, while I'm waiting for Bo to shoot a actual question on EQ, let's look at two different things. Let's look at the way that I code um, Purist Drive and the way my brother recoded Purist Drive to uh, purify it further. Because this gets into the kind of stuff, yeah, nodes. Nodes are very interesting. Nodes are like the step beyond uh, Photoshop or whatever. In terms of compositing and things, nodes can have relation to game programming. If you are doing shader making in certain ways, and they're very relevant to compositing. You can you you shoot shoot your question now. I'm not going to be able to do the thing that I wanted to do. I can't find the plugin that I was trying to adapt, so I have to go and dig it up out of CD drive somewhere, and that could take hours. Like, everything I've tried to do in the last month has been hours of not getting anywhere, so I'll do that. I'll do that for the purpose to get the one that I was looking for, but I'm not going to do it on stream. because it involves getting up off camera and wandering around, digging through CDs and things. So this is a fine time for you to shoot any question you've got or any of the rest of you for the next uh, little over an hour that I will spend. And while you're doing that, let's show you two different ways of doing literally the same thing. Because the point here was I had Purist Drive. Purist Drive is this big. It is this much. So it's not utterly and totally trivial like a 
gain plugin. Yeah, you can. I'm literally doing this. Uh, LX, no, that can't happen. Even if I could, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. I would refuse to do that. Go and get a copy of Soothe or something. Get a copy of Soothe and put it on all of the tracks and all of the buses and then mix all of the buses together. And it will be absolute garbage, but you can pretend that it's good. There is no such thing as an instant good mix plugin because it's far too interesting a pursuit. I'm going to be getting into that when I do more of the music streams on days that I'm less caught up in the weird chord stuff and learning how to begin to use what I've put together at the moment. Like there will be days when I'm doing sort of a mix stream and streaming out a logic, much like when I'm doing the plugin videos. But that's the thing is that to mix is not about equaling everything out. There are things you can get from equaling everything out that are kind of like the recipe for ketchup. Heinz ketchup is a special kind of ketchup that is far more successful than all other kinds. You can make variations. They kind of act like tomato sauce or something. And there will be an entire shelf full of different variations of only Heinz ketchup. And uh, anything else might be in an entirely other separate section of the store. And the reason is flavor has various components. It has like sour, sweet, salty, bitter, umami, which is like richness of, of taste. And Heinz ketchup balances these perceptions to a magical degree to where the resulting flavor doesn't taste like any one. It's like it confuses your senses to where the resulting flavor doesn't seem like any one thing. Now, when you talk about instant good mix, Good mix can be kind of like that, but it's never completely like that. And Styrian has a very good point there, which you should pay attention to, LXUAE. Um, the thing is that if something pokes, like, for instance, consider the, the mix of Metallica's and Justice for All. People say, oh my God, that has such good guitars on it. Well, they ought to think it has good guitars on it. The guitars are five times louder than the bass. You can do that. If you have your song and you're like, this song needs to be only about the guitars, then you make them not balance. You make them louder and set them up just the way you want, make them sound just the way you want, and people will be like, Wow, check out those guitars. That is how it's done. That doesn't mean it's a good mix. It's kind of not. They sold much better on the Metallica Black album when Bob Rock came in and the bass guitar started to get to participate in the mix. So there is a function of balancing things out. There's also a function of how can you get stuff to meld, combine with each other, but there's no plugin that will do that automatically for you. And even if it did, that would be short circuiting your ability to try to pay attention to what's happening. So when Styrian Golding says you want monitoring, yes, I have a plugin called monitoring that has many different settings on it for things like peaks, slew, subs, and in fact, I tried that on the little jam that I did for the LR flip plugin and ran some of that stuff through so that I was like, okay, well, we've got this so far. What happens when I put it to peaks only? Oh, this part is all louder and this part is blending in and I can't hear this anymore. So that means I can turn this up. And I'd put on subs and go like, okay, now th the bass, which is very heavy already, could be bigger. 
because the the kick is completely overwhelming it. I wanted the kick to be huge, but that doesn't mean that I wanted the kick to completely obliterate the bass, so I brought it up. And yeah, yeah, you do that. And slew, then you hear only the highs, and it's like, okay, now what have we got from there? And uh, that's the thing, is... Mixing so often, at least at the very high levels, is messing around making stuff translate. And when you say translate, usually what you mean is make the song translate. If you have a song that's like, I don't know, I'm thinking of some Beatles thing. And the things I'm thinking of are bad examples anyhow. Like there's, there's, I'll think of something completely different. I'll think of a Brian Eno thing. If you get a Brian Eno ambient mix, and it's just sort of droning, chill kinds of stuff, or these bing, like Rhodes notes, electric piano notes, you could run that into Sooth and it'll bring up all the highs and it'll bring up all the lows and it'll grab your attention to some extent, anyhow. To some extent it won't, but to some extent it'll be, you know, manufactured into something that grabs the attention because all the shiny frequencies are there. And the point of those Eno records is ambient music. If it is grabbing your attention, it is failing to do the thing that the music is for. Similarly, if you're doing like a aggressive thrash metal thingy or whatever, if all the sounds are merging really smoothly so that it's all kind of rounded off and it's got a very euphonic, chill kind of sound, that's not doing what the music is for. The bottom line is you have to go and work out what the thing is trying to accomplish only then can you mix, because only then do you have a purpose for doing the uh, mix. And the plugin isn't going to help you because the plugin is, no matter what it would be, would be a fixed intention of some kind. Uh, I like I like mixing uh, on speakers rather than headphones, although that is more challenging. That ends up getting you into the zone where. You have to get speakers that work. You have to get like a sub or something. I've been able to make a bunch of that stuff DIY. I have a really nice subwoofer design DIY. And uh, that's I'm going to have to put that up or do another one like that and put that up on the new website that I'm going to do once the Patreon gets me into the hardware uh, zone. But when you're working with speakers, you do have to do those things. My hope is that I can also do stuff like figure out how to wire chips together so that you could DIY your own speaker and you would also be DIYing the amp to drive it and it would all end up coming out being basically good, but all the parts would cost you 50 bucks. That kind of thing. I'd like to do something like that. So yeah, well, I'm not sure if I got the EQ question from, shoot the EQ questions anytime you want, Bo. And yeah, mixing on headphones, it's worth getting fancier headphones. And even then, again, monitoring might help you there because I've got those CANS settings and the CAN settings will make the headphones act a little bit more like speakers by sort of phase rotating and changing things to where the delicate uh, peak energy that can get right past you on headphones will get blurred out a little bit and will become a little bit more audible. I still don't favor mixing on he headphones as a rule, but uh, you did? Did I miss it or did I answer it? If I didn't answer it, ask it again. Over to Purist Drive. For mine, 
this is as big as the audio code is. And I was like, well, how can you refactor that? There's nothing more to it. Oh, yeah, I was beginning to talk about that with this as an example. You can store older sample values in variables. I thought you needed arrays for that. Here's the thing. I'll, I'll explain why that is. See how this says, while well, n sample frames minus minus equals zero, and we got like in frames to process up here, and sample frames equals in frames to process. Minus minus means it's being made smaller after we consult the value of this. If it was minus minus n sample frames, it would make it smaller and then ask what the value is and use it in this. But with this, it's looking at what the value is, getting a true or false out of this larger than zero here. And after it's gotten the true or false, it is minus minus, it is subtracting one from it. So it's getting this and counting it down. Every time it goes through the loop and in frames to process, that is your buffer. Like when you're like, I'm going to use a 1024 buffer, it'll have more latency, but my computer can do its mix. And if I make the latency too small, it crashes. This is what you're modulating. You're, you're altering the size of these chunks of, of samples. And more at once means it's more efficient. And fewer at once means it's way less efficient. So if you tried to go for crazy low latency by doing 16 sample uh, latency, it's going to do these 16 at a time. Or it could do it 256 at a time or whatever. It could be doing it. You could be trying to do it eight at a time. And it'll be like when eight, you know, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, it'll go through this eight times and then it'll go on to the next thing. So see where it says in a earlier version that I'm going to have to find. And this is my older one. See where this currently is a double double previous sample in the H file where we just store stuff that's persistent across buffers. That's a single variable. It could be a double. It could be float 64. It could be a long double. Um, this is one number, not an array. It's one variable. And the way that works is we start going through this buffer. We've got it. It's like, okay, we've got this many. Well, n sample frames equals 256. Okay, we're starting with that. We're doing this loops 256 times. It goes through. It does this stuff. It needs to make a reference to a previous sample in order to do its thing. And it's using that as literally it's calling a previous sample and it says previous sample equals sign dry sample. That's being put in that variable, which is sitting there to be used. And then we go through the buffer again and boop, now that we're, we got a new input sample and previous sample is what dry sample was last time. So this is for the last one that we hit. This is using that. We go through to zero. We've done the entire buffer. That means we're done with this part. Previous sample equals sign dry sample, the last one that we've got. And we store it in this variable. It's not an array, it's a variable. Go through to the end. And we're done. We're over to another channel. We're over to another plugin. We have gone through the uh, latency buffer for this plugin. And previous sample is still sitting there in the place and memory that we made for it. Like, uh, again, it's in purest drive. It was defined here. And that's going to just sit there until the next time we get around to doing another buffer. Next time we start up, we're doing this channel again. We're doing this plugin again. We come back in here and go, oh, hey, we've got another buffer. This is a whole new set of samples to work with. It's an array and it's a source P and it's pointing to however many samples we need to use. And we're using in sample frames for which one we look at. Again, at the end of this, the source P 
plus equals in num channels does p plus equals in num channels. This is the way of it stepping through its array and all that stuff. But you know what? Previous sample is still sitting there holding the one number that we put in it last. This whole thing is like if we're on the audio unit, process can do quad, it can do 5-1, it can do all kind, you know, all kinds of funny formats, mono, stereo, anything like that. And it's going to call this kernel for every channel ind independently. That's why in num channels exists, is because it's being handed a pile which is the entire buffer with all of the samples interleaved. And in num samples is how much do we have to skip forwards to get to another left? And it'll go through and it'll do all the lefts. And then it'll make a special version of previous sample just for this one context being we're working on the lefts now. And there will be another process that's working on the rights. And it'll step forwards until it gets to look at only the samples of the rights. And it has its own example of previous sample. And that's just one number put away somewhere. It's being invoked by process. So that one number is the previous sample of all the left samples or all the right samples, whichever is being called. And it's going to stay the same thing until we need to use it next. We could have it be previous sample equals dry sample. And then it's just the last uh, thing in the buffer. We go through the buffer, we go into a different channel, we go into all the other plugins, we get back with the next chunk of buffer, and we carry on where we left off. So how's that, Bo? If you needed a whole thing with older sample values, any calculation that you do could be put away this way. It doesn't have to be just a sample. Like, apply is a factor that is like, the previous sample plus input sample divided by two, both of those have sign factors added to them. And divided by two and times intensity, intensity is how much we turn the drive factor up. And what we're doing is like smoothing the attack of it a little bit. It's two adjacent samples. Good, good. I was able to explain it. Um, we could put previous up we could make a previous apply if we wanted to or we could make a you know nine previous applies for instance like if we were to do something that acted kind of like a uh, array but wasn't one we could do something like this So if we did this and we had those set up where previous sample was, we would be able to work with the variable that was like four samples ago. Or we could make it be apply and have used the apply from four samples ago or whatever. We can put these little delays and things in here. This is a really primitive way of doing that. But all of those are just one variable. They're not an array. You could use any name for them, like, for instance, that works too. You just define them in the place where I defined previous sample. You normally try to give things sensible names, but that works too. Or, uh, So if we did this, then, and see how that also connects to this? It's the same little pattern. These are all separate little sam separate variables. They're not part of an array. They can be used individually. You don't have to have an index number for 
software and the array to apply it, but they are all going to, um, every time you go through, you're going, oh, each one takes the uh, current one, we're going in this order, so number four is what three was last time, number three is what two was last time, number two is what previous was last time, previous is what sign is this time, and you wind up making this delay, because if you, if you did it the opposite direction, like, uh, you following this? Let's reverse it and tell me what that would do. So if we reversed it, what would we get? We'd get previous equals sign dry sample, okay. And then B equals previous, which is sign dry sample. And F equals B, which is previous, which is sign dry sample and j equals f, so we're basically making it be this, which does work, but now they're all the same. If you want to do the delay thing, it works in the other direction, and it works on the basis of having you know, being able to put variables and values aside and then get back to them when you need them. That's what we're doing in this H file. That's what we're doing when we define something over here is like, okay, this is a, this is private to the plugin that we're using and we're going to be using it in process. We're going to be using it in purest drive kernel in general. And that's just going to save the value in here. It's not an array, doesn't have to be. Could be, but it doesn't have to be. And we get to use that with the sample buffers coming in, which are arrays, because when we're working with the sample buffer as arrays, we're only altering one piece of it at a time. We're stepping through the sample buffer array. Technically, it's got it as counting down. And that's the order of the sequence. You could have it be counting up, and that would do something weird. That would probably make it so that, um, or, uh, yeah, you could have it counting up and have source P start at something and then be minus in num channels and desk P minus in num channels. And then you'd be kind of reading through each of the buffers backwards as you went. So when they transition to the next buffer, it would do something strange and unexpected. That is not good. So yeah, shoot any other questions. I was going to, I've got another 45 minutes or so uh, while I can't work on the plugin that I was wanting to work on or do any of the things I wanted to do, but I can show you something weird and crazy because might as well. It's an example of the stuff I try not to do. Firstly, here's the code. This is like part of a challenge. Back in the day, my brother who helped me set up the VST stuff uh, was like, I like refactoring things. I think your code is bad and ugly. It should be refactored. And I was like, well, really? Well, I know that some of my stuff is complicated, but I've got some things that are so simple you couldn't possibly refactor them. Like this. So Purist Drive was the example that I used. And in a way, I was right. And in a way, oh boy, was I wrong. Because I started with this. It says, we're making this a sign that does a tonal alteration to it. It's like a density change. Apply becomes a value that is always positive, fabs, and it's 
the average of the previous sample and the one we just made a sign of. So it's going to be the sign of what we've got or the last sample. So it's averaging our signed out, slightly distorted um, variable. And then times intensity means it's going to go from, let me check what the size of it is, uh, 0 to 1. Because k per m1 is set so the minimum value is 0 and the maximum value is 1. Crank it up all the way and this part goes away. Like if we, if we crank up intensity as far as it will go, it's the same as this. Because intensity will equal 1. And again, it's not really the same as that because this is still a multiply with something at the volume level of one. But we just did a divide at the volume level of, at the, the number level of two. So we're probably fine with this. There, It's like if your input samples and previous samples were some microscopic amount and you had to multiply it by a number like one or two, Sometimes those can go away because you're having to do math in floating point. But with this, since we've already divided by two, we're probably fine. So this is going to give us pretty much the same thing as input sample, but abs, meaning that it's always positive. There's no negative. So it's going to be a sign output, meaning that it'll go between negative one and one. You apply something to sign and it will loop around and go back down to zero again after a certain point. So this is a way of soft clipping that stuff. It's gradually going to curve over until as the sound keeps getting louder, it's not getting any higher and in fact it turns around and stops getting, starts getting smaller. So apply will always be less than one and always be more than zero. Then, input sample equals dry sample times 1 minus apply plus input sample times apply. So this is almost uh, spiral-like. In fact, it is rather spiral-like. What we're doing here is if apply is cranked up all the way, you know, intensity is 1 and the average of the samples is max, then it's going to have input sample B the same thing as what it was before, like sine input sample. If that's maxed out, then we're getting the sine factor. If on the other hand, it's really small, it's like down to nearly zero, apply is gonna also end up being nearly zero. Or if you turn intensity down, it'll get down to nearly zero. At that point, what we just calculated, the sine part becomes almost nothing and dry sample becomes really big. Dry sample becomes one minus almost nothing, or it's dry sample times one minus almost nothing. So input sample ends up being closer to dry sample if it's smaller. This is like spiral. This is a lot like spiral, purest drive is. And then previous sample equals sine dry sample, which is the same as we started with. We haven't done anything to actually change it at any point. Storing up what the sign was. And uh, we could also be doing that here, but we're not. We could get rid of some of these things just by applying them everywhere. Like let's do it. My brother was talking about doing refactors. Let's do a quick refactor of this. Firstly, I'm going to cut it away and like stash it elsewhere <laughs> and we're going to ignore that for now. So all this stuff that we did up, uh, no, not really that. Um, we could be doing this more often. by applying it in these places. It'll make a little bit more sense that way. And if we do that, we don't need that part. 
and then add it again here because we didn't actually store it that way. And now we've got something that's a little smaller. Like we've still got um, dry sample being just no change added to it, but we've made it a little smaller. All that's here now is like this. If we have intensity always cranked out, then that goes away too. And if we made this a little bit more complicated, we could take that away from here. Again, refactoring is changing things around in such a way that it doesn't change what the sound or the behavior of the program does. And then we can also bust this out. To do this, you have to have a semicolon in there. We don't need as many parentheses if we've just simplified that. We don't need this many parentheses either. Except for I'd like to have those because I just would. And so now we've got four lines of code, but they're all a little more approachable. They all are a little more, I'd, I'd like to say, sensible. And they're smaller. So we've got apply equals fabs input sample plus, we can make that simpler too. We could put that here and here. See, we're kind of doing stuff repetitively, but, but we're also simplifying the stuff. Um, and you're right. Sturian Golding has spotted that you do need that on the fabs apply. Easily done. Well spotted. See, that's the thing with refactoring. You start fooling with stuff, and then who knows? Maybe it's not actually going to do what you thought. But we've now simplified apply, so it's very direct. It is the previous sample plus input sample. They're both doing the sign thing, so they're both doing the soft clip. And that's very direct. We can also add yet another phase of we'll do that as a whole separate thing. It's like, okay, now that we've got that, now it is divided by two. And now we don't need this. We can make this go away. Because now it'll only go from uh, zero to one. Actually, it'll go from negative one to one. That's why we have the fabs here. And we could simplify that even further. That means we can take it away here. We've got it twice there. We don't need it twice there. And step by step, this starts looking more and more like assembly language. It starts looking more and more primitive. We got apply equals these plus, you know, we're, we're adding the signs together. We're making it half as big as it is. We're making it positive. This is like an assembly language thing. This is like um, you've got an opcode for 
any given little functionality and we're applying opcodes to single memory words and stuff like that. We've got input sample equals dry times one minus apply. Like I said, when the number is small, that means it's mostly dry sample. It's like spiral. Spiral starts out mostly dry sample and it transitions to the soft clip as we reach clipping. Although the weird thing about purist drive is the way this is coded, if you go beyond clipping, it'll start getting weird again. It'll start um, going back to dry sample again. So that's interesting, but that's part of the, the purist drive sound, that if you push it beyond, it'll start... Technically, if you're pushing it beyond by running hot into it, the dry sample is going to be fairly large, so it'll start soft clipping, and then it'll start getting louder again as you push harder. So that's a quirk of purist drive. We add sign input sample times apply, and then we store what the previous sample was coming in, which is from here. So here is our refactored version that looks like assembly language. It looks like antique computer programming. And what we had previously, I'll copy and paste that. And that replaces this, which is a little smaller because the sentences are a little longer. Like we're making, we're doing the sign factor here so that we don't have to do sign multiple times. But then, and if sign calculation takes longer than looking up a memory lookup, this is faster. If sign calculation is faster than looking something up in memory, this is slower. And you'd be wanting to do sign every time it comes up as its own calculation. And that is sometimes that, that's why we have 1.0 minus apply rather than calculating out something else as I mean we could make one of those back in the day I was making uh, wet dry controls and having a dry factor and just defining that as 1.0 minus wet so that you didn't have to do the math and doing the math is sometimes faster And so this is purest drive as I had it. This is the thing that I was like, you can't make that any simpler. Well, here's what Dan did with it. We've still got prem one as zero to one. We've got some funny stuff going on here. He decided to put things in H that I didn't even understand. So, see how we've got, pre we've still got previous sample, it's slightly different, but now we've got another thing. It says, if demo, int demo, that was something from a really old version, I think. I think I had the demo fade in there. Now we've got something called noise shape and current shape index, a class called noise shaper that lives inside the class called purist drive kernel. We've got a, actually that's probably a function. Um, we've got a long double, that is a function too. We've got void merge sample errors, and that is also a function. It's a void function. It doesn't return a value. And a long double, here's another one. This is probably having to do with the... Uh, it is not a perfect match, because this is also including the <sighs> dithering to floating point that I was doing back in the day, which isn't exactly the same as the current version does. And noise shaper, noise shape. See, that is class noise shaper. So, what we've got is we contain these things in this thing that's called a class. 
and then we define a instance of that as noise shape. So we called it this, but we're not going to actually see that anywhere. And then we've got a couple of other things in the same way that we had previous sample. Why did the current system stop making working for making AU plugins? What I'm working on right now isn't making plugins for Big Sur. That's the problem. I'm still making AU plugins the same as I ever had. They still work for all the same things that they ever did. Apple broke something. So, we have now defined an instance of this class here, the class Noise Shaper. So we have a Noise Shaper class instance, which is the Noise Shape. And we've got sign input samples. That is, a, that is returning a long double variable, but it takes two different variables in. It's a float 32 and a float 64. And we've also got a float 32 called applied demo sabotage. So here, we start looking at the CPP file. Here's where stuff starts getting a little messy. So we got reset. And if demo is defined, I think I define it up here maybe. Or maybe it was in the H file. This is why I don't program this way. Somewhere around here, you would be going uh, You'd be doing something like this. Like if you were doing the uh, demo build where you were building one that like fades to silence every now and then, you'd kind of do this. But not with these, I don't think, but I could be wrong. And you do something like this. And then elsewhere, you get to ask stuff like if demo, and then you're defining this variable only if that was a thing that you said earlier. If you said this, define demo, I think that's how that works. Then it runs this stuff. Otherwise, it doesn't run this stuff. And this doesn't end up being a variable in any of that. And likewise, Back over to here, it's doing that there too. If demo, then we initialize the variable that wouldn't exist. Like if we did this here and weren't running a demo, then it would be like, we don't know what this is, error. But we're only doing it if that's defined. So we're conditionally compiling. Now here's Dan's take on the process thing. Remember what we were doing in Paris Drive before? Well, here's what we've got, intensity. And he's replacing the entire way that this works, seemingly. Um, he's got, well, source P is not equal to end P and he's defined an NP as in source P plus in frames to process. Let's see what we did, or let's see what the Apple code had, because he's actually refactored the Apple code too. Everything got refactored. So we had it as, um, in sample frames, source P, desk P, and we're just counting down in sample frames to see whether it's zero or not. Whereas with Dan's version, we got source P, end P, and I don't remember whether we had even anything called end P in the Apple code. I think not. I think that's extra. It added something that didn't exist before. See, it fit in here, and its refactoring is this big. It starts up here. And we're defining an extra thing just to be end P. It's in source P plus in frames to process. And well, that's not equal to end P. Never mind zero, never mind counting an in frames to process. We now ignore in frames to process and we're doing it in a different way. 
long double combined input sample equals sign input samples. Uh, okay, of source P, okay, and drive intensity. Let's go find that. So we start right off with this. There's also some stuff called const in here that I'll explain about. And that would be, I don't know where to find this now. Um, see, this is, this is why I don't code stuff this way. Um, so sign input samples is not actually here. And I have to go and find where it is because, or no, wait, no, this is, this is signed input samples. So I, I just missed it because I was looking for it in the wrong place. So this is our main loop. Process lives here. So he's made it smaller. Now it's just this big. thing is, yeah, I know, right, control F, and it's in blue because there's something here that means that if I changed it, no, it is, it is uh, mixed up. I can't make that be wrong. Um, I was trying to break it, but uh, the compiler doesn't uh, read that just yet. So, combined input sample, remember what we were doing? We were taking the previous sample and the current one, and they both had to go through a sign function, right? So it's this the same as doing this, going like input sample, sign input sample, and having this around that was sign dry sample. But in this case, we're doing it, calling in combined input samples and sign input samples. We also have some kind of thing which is based on like what I had previously. This is the current floating point dither, but I had a different one and I don't know how it works now because it's, I'm not able to figure it out from this code, but this is how that works. This, this noise shape function was doing the floating point noise thing that I was doing back in the day, the, the previous version of it that I did. So what we're doing is going combined input sample is input sample plus previous uh, sample, and they both have been through a sign function. So we know that that's what theoretically happens when we get this. That's here. So this is what makes that do the thing. They all live in purest drive kernel, but this is a separate thing that lives in purest drive kernel. And it says, Float 32 and original input sample and drive intensity. We have fed it source P and drive intensity. So now that we're inside input samples and doing the thing that we wanted to do, const long double. Const means we're defining this thing and it doesn't change. That's relevant to the compiler. The compiler sometimes likes it if you're able to tell like, oh, hey, const this, just make this and then you're not going to have to do anything to it. Const is like constant. So direct sample signed is sign original input sample, which comes from here, which comes from source P. So we chase it into this and now we have a long double, which is a constant. And that's the direct sample const float 64 previous sample signed. That could be long double too, probably. Sign so previous sample. And you know what? Since we didn't do it to the one that was fed in, we can do previous sample equals original input sample, which goes back to here, which goes back to here, which is source P. And since we've done this calculation already of the previous sample signed, that means that's going to work. So we're now accessing the one that we were doing like just directly but we're doing it in this little sub calculation, which is about making the input samples be signed and, you know, distorting, soft clipping them. So this is also storing the previous one from what the original sample is. 
And there's no special reason why that would live in sign input samples. It's not sign input samples and store the previous one. That would look like this. That would be more exp uh, explanatory, but that's not what we got. So now we have a sub calculation that does stuff that isn't written on the tin. And that can be a problem. In any case, it does actually work. And we're still in this sign input samples. So I think we're doing additional things beyond actually the sign inputs. Like, remember how we did this? Abs. And, and these have been signed in this case, so we're doing abs. And then with the supply thing, it's divided by two so that it can be the size of any given one and times intensity. Uh, the professional programmer way of doing that is like this, which is blended samples abs signed, and that is fabs. So that's these ones that are signs divided by two. And that is also a const, because now that we've got that, we don't need to do anything further with it. And then we are also taking that and doing that as a separate state. Now, we could also extend that even further. It's not necessary, but it's possible. We could do something like this. And then we wouldn't have to do this. It's the same kind of deal. It's like, uh, and then we would have to use that here. It would be drive intensity times and divided by two. So you can kind of break that stuff down as much as you want. It's how trivial you want to get it, how many things you want to see, and which things you want to see in which places. Now, we have made drive intensity times signed signal. That's drive intensity times blended simples ab signed. Now, apparently we are going to do um, each of these, like the, the direct and the previous, we're keeping them separate this whole time along. We could, in theory, just add them together and do all of this, but for some reason we're doing this at, on each one individually. So, oh, no, and I, actually I do understand why, because we're no longer worrying about previous sample and input sample, we're on to this section. Dry sample equals one minus apply, input sample times apply. We used to call that apply, and in this we're calling it Drive intensity times sign signal. So we're making this stuff here and this here, but we're using longer words. So attenuated direct sample signed and attenuated input sample. I was calling that dry sample. You could call that dry sample. The reason I call it dry sample is because I know dry sample is the one I haven't been changing, but that doesn't really count here because we're all over the place with everything. So we're not using the term dry sample exactly. But this is doing the same thing that this does. And input sample equals that. That's putting it back into this stuff that we're going to end up spitting out. But here it's returning attenuated input, it's returning these two things. So we could smoosh that into a single longer expression, but instead we've made it into two new variables and we're returning that plus that. They've been scaled down to where they will add together appropriately. And as we return, remember we were in sign input samples when we return, we get the value back that we tell it to get back. And so long double combined input sample equals the result of 
this whole thing. Combined input sample equals all of this, which is also kind of the same thing as these two lines. There's a lot more words in there. Now we've also got this thing here, which is demo sabotage, and that gets weirder. Let's apply demo sabotage. That's, and we have to go all the way back up here to get back to what we're actually doing. So this, all we've been talking about is this line. That's everything so far that I've been talking about. But that doesn't really finish it up because remember how we made this? Now we use it in some way. And output sample, noise shape, bring the noise, combine input sample. So now we have a thing called output sample. It's a const. So it's constant, it's not going to be changed. And we're doing this rigmarole to it. So let's see, let's go and find noise shape, bring the noise. That's going to live down here. So see how this says noise shaper, bring the noise. And up here it says, where did we find it? I can't find anything with this style of programming. That's the, that's the trouble. But I mean, this is when I'm trying to solve things like why doesn't my stuff work on Big Sur? All the Apple guys code like this. I generally can't make heads or tail of it. All the professional programmers do this stuff. Anybody that you see doing like advanced graphics coding for stuff like Juice or whatever are immersed in this kind of stuff all the time and they know how to do this. And this is what it's like. This is what all their stuff is like. Let's go back to, so noise shape, bring the noise, combined input sample. Now, I'm calling a thing called noise shape, but I'm going to look for a thing called noise shaper. And that is going to invoke bring the noise because I invoked a instance. We'll go back to H. Oh, no, that's not. That's my H. That's much simpler. How about you go away now? We've already seen that. Um, When I, when I say and see this, this is an array called noise shape, which is a different entirely other thing. We're, we're doing obfuscation here. I think, I think uh, my brother is so into doing the corporate programming that sometimes he obfuscates naturally and the sort of job protection kind of thing. So noise shape here is not the same as noise shape here. This is a array with two and two values in there. I think it's going to be zero and one. And this is a noise shape er with the same name, but without the brackets on, which make it be an array. So this is a class. The class contains these things in it, including the function bring the noise. So when you define this class and then go, okay, of noise shapers, we're going to do a noise shape instance of this class. We invoke all of these things and go noise shape. Oh, he, there's the class that I made. We called it noise shape. We could call it Fred for all the difference it would make and bring the noise. So let's go and find bring the noise and bring the noise happens to live here in the name of the class, not the name of the instance that we made. And that shows us that any instance we make, we could have a, a instance of noise shaper called Fred and an instance of noise shaper called Arthur. And you could say Fred bring the noise or Arthur bring the noise and it would do two separate things. We're asking for long double sample. So back up here, bring the noise, combine input sample. We're bringing that down into here. And this gives us a const long double error equals, hey, get 32 bit rounding error. Where's that? Uh, down here. That's another, let's, let's see whether, yeah, it's defined too. Class noise shaper, 
Public class, long double bring the noise. Private class, long double get 32-bit rounding error, meaning that we can call bring the noise from outside the actual class, but this one, you can't see it from where the other stuff was done. We can't see get 32-bit rounding error. It might even show up in the coloring. Uh, we can't see it from here. Uh, let's see. I just did a copy of that. Let's Now, here's the deal. That just showed up in blue, meaning that it's acting as if I could get to it from what is here. But it shouldn't. It should be looking more like this because that's a private class, not a public class. So a public class is the stuff that you can call from inside process or whatever. This other one that is lighting up in blue, but I think it would cause a error and not work because you're not supposed to be able to access this function from out here. You're supposed to be accessing that function from inside bring the noise, inside the noise shaper class. We get 32 bit rounding error from sample. I'm going to have to add some more spaces under here so you can see it. All that says is rounding error long double to round is what comes in. We're giving it a, uh, I think we're giving it a long double, probably. Yeah, long double sample. So anything that comes in, we're, we're working in long double a resolution here. Float 32 rounded equals to round, return to round minus long double rounded. What that does is kind of like what I was doing with an earlier version of uh, floating point uh, dithering. I wasn't actually dithering at the time, I was trying to noise shape. This is taking the variable and subtracting the output of it, get, subtracting the 32-bit version of what I was working with, and then storing the remainder. So get 32-bit rounding error, which amusingly is not lit up in blue here. <laughs> All of this stuff is like this. It is It is really, you know, so, sometimes it's because this stuff is really that hard, and sometimes, like with C++, it's because somebody was pretending their job by making things unreasonably complicated. In any case, it's not in blue here, but it's in blue here and everywhere else. So error equals get 32-bit rounding error sample. What this did is what we sent in, it's the same as this. Wait, there's error, so. I think I need to put another print. Yep, there we go. What we did is something kind of like this, uh, but not the equal, minus. So error equals 32-bit rounding error. It's a long double. We're doing something kind of like this. We're kind of like, you know, force the thing to be a 32-bit and then subtract that, or Did I spell that out? Hang on. This would also work. Up but not. This would also work. 
it would be kind of the same as the this this routine here is if you went 32 bit version equals sample and then the error is sample minus the floor 32 32 bit version but instead we go over here to do it and we'll make these bits go away because that's not part of how that worked merge sample errors is also private let's see yep merge sample errors long double error that's a void that doesn't return anything so how does that even work we're sending this resulting thing in it's actually a const merge sample errors doesn't give us anything on the output it's just like do this thing Here's the value to do it to. It's a const value, so you're not going to change it. And that lives here. So we're getting this in here. We've got const float32. Oh, hey, I'm doing golden ratio stuff again. Um, proportion to keep, golden ratio. Proportion to change is the inverse. And now we are doing noise shape current shape index equals that times proportion to keep plus error proportion to change so one of the things we had going on was a clearly i was doing a interleaved thing i was keeping two i remember now because i remember doing this it's not in the code of the one i was showing you but i was keeping two variables going and they were both taking in the remainders and applying some of them to the final result. But they were also fading away. They were an IIR filter. They were getting smaller as time went on in this way. So current shape index is being dealt with somewhere entirely else. It's not even mentioned in this other than right here. But what it was for was switching between two variables, switching between two IR filters that was interleaving them. So back over to here, merge sample errors is defining this stuff and manipulating noise shape, which is not the same thing as noise shape, the instance of noise shaper. Current shape index is going to be one or zero. And it's doing only the one relative to where it's supposed to use. Um, now that we've done that, const long output sample looks like we're getting somewhere. Sample plus noise shape being the remainder. And we're feeding it back in. Um, and then current shape index equals current shape index plus one modulus two that's going to make it go between zero and one if i'm not mistaken so that's a handy little way of it, it's as if it, it's as if current shape index was a boolean and you went boolean thing equals not boolean thing you're flipping it but it's flipping between zero and one which is technically what boolean also can do um, and return output sample so where were we we're returning from bring the noise in an instance of noise shape, so that's where we were looking for. So we go back to look for not bring the noise or noise shape er, but way up here somewhere, noise shape. So here's a new version of output sample that's different from the one that we had in here. The one that we had in here gave us return output sample, const long double output sample, but Um, we're now making another output sample, which is the result of this thing that we did, similar to the uh, dithering to floating point stuff that I did. Coming back from this pile of stuff, and it says, and noise shaping on 32-bit output. That's what I used to say for the noise shaper. Then, const float32 narrowed output sample equals float32 output sample. Funny, I thought we just did that. This is similar to what I'm doing down here. I'm not sure why we're doing it again. Um, 
sabotaged output apply demo sabotage narrowed output sample. So here's the thing. This seems weird. We got our long double. It's noise shaped. I guess what's happening is we're at the point where we're assigning it to the output uh, variable. And so we're going to need it to be a float32 anyhow. So we're making it be the 32 bit that we're going to use to assign it to test P, which is also a, 30, a, a float 32. So we're going to make it be that. We're going to convert it directly to that. And then we're doing this demo thing, which isn't really a factor from my current plugins, but this is what I was doing when I was selling them for 50 bucks a pop. So you can, you can see Dan's take on how that was, how that would be done. Maybe I can even find an instance of it uh, elsewhere. Let's find an instance of it in some of these early things. What was actually being sold? Oh, look, a free verb. I think maybe it's delay was being sold. Let's find out. I kind of know where to look for these. You can see that's relatively small, but I do not see the code I was looking for. So no, apparently not you. Maybe I can find it in Antique. Was Compressor one of the ones that this code in? You can see it kind of starts looking different. Uh, nope. Notice the size of this code also with the entire routine. Rather than being a bunch of different things, everything's getting defined up here. All the variables are being made up there. And the code just looks like this. It's a string of things that are almost like assembly language. I don't know. Like, what was I trying to sell? Distance, maybe? Here's the old distance. Nope. Check this out. This is how big distance was. And back when I was just beginning to learn to code, all these were being made zero. These are all stuff that's being stored, Bo, like I was talking about before. Here we're defining some of these things like this bit looks very similar to uh, what I do today. This stuff is actually the same, but this stuff is making a bunch of things. Back in the day, I was only programming with 32-bit variables. And this is how big the original distance plugin was. It's that big. I'm not even using uh, input sample as a word and Look at how many of these things are just individual. This is all assembly language style. All of this stuff is like one operation. It's all like ASM. Like that is that, that's the only thing in there. That's one subtraction. Both of these are the same thing, but they're this. It looks a lot like assembly language. I mean, even back in the day, people thought my stuff ran fast. And back in the day, this actually might have helped it to run fast. It's not as much of a case these days. But this is what the assembly stuff looks like. Interestingly, there's a way of programming assembly in the modern day, which is WebAssembly. But you don't necessarily do that using assembly language. You do that using stuff like C and so on. Let's not save that. I think actually I have a copy of this somewhere. But maybe I simply don't. Okay. 
I can't find the code for this supply demo sabotage, but uh, now I'm curious. Like now I'm frustrated. Now I want to find it. Let's just open the raw file. This is what my cab simulator used to look like. See, that's an array. And this is a little bit hilarious. This doesn't actually help you. Remember how I said if you could, you know, Fred equals Arthur, Arthur equals something, and it's bucket brigading everything along. This is what that looks like if you're doing it with a big array. Nobody would really want to see this. I used to do this because I thought that it was faster than using an extra variable, which is not necessarily true. Modern computers, you can make an extra variable do a loop like this, and it'll be as fast or faster, because this is no longer like the 6502. And compiling does, comp it takes a loop and converts it into something much like this. And then here is a big pile of, this is also why I can't update some stuff very easily. Like I can't easily convert this to be 96K compatible, Unless I was to like, you know, B80, B82, skip it around like that. Um, but this is essentially the same thing as a uh, convolution kernel. This is like Space Designer. Where it's adding a bunch of stuff or subtracting a bunch of stuff. And this is also the character slash bus colors method of, it's the original character method rather than the bus colors method of taking your variable and altering it based on how loud it is. So this complicated set of algorithms, see how this is pluses and then minuses, and there's a plus, minus, 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 there's a plus here, more minuses, more pluses. This is all sort of worked out in a detailed way, and it's making the reverb impulses convert on the fly, but it's a bit messy and it didn't have the code I was looking for, so never mind it. Um, this is a fun one. I wish I knew how to make this work again. This was a graphical program. Here's the H file. It seems to have, or maybe this is a, oh, hey, look, my anti-aliasing stuff. Actually, I wonder whether I can, there's the H file, there's the C++ file. Aha! Oh, I'm sad. See, it says removed demo timer. That's where the code would have been. This is my old uh, anti-aliasing code and I need to find a instance of it, so that's cool anyway. This was supposed to show a picture on the screen. It worked once. It died. Just looking here, that's not what I meant to do. See all this derping around with stuff? This is like the modern versions of Xcode. Ah, I found it. Check it out. All of that stuff with apply demo sabotage and down here where it's going apply demo sabotage it's doing a demo timer, this and that and the other. This is a whole separate thing that lives in the kernel. It's actually not any different than, it's in a different place. The stuff that got really tricky was Noise Shaper, where it was taking the uh, floating point noise shaping I was doing back in the day. I wonder if I've got any of that here.
looks a little it looks a little bit like it doesn't this one did a bunch of other weird stuff uh, I don't remember exactly what the deal was with this this was a space odyssey it was meant to make things sound like myspace <laughs> as if you would ever want to make things sound like myspace but the idea was like oh mix into this and then it'll turn it back off again and you'll know what you're getting on myspace because myspace was chopping sample rate to from 44.1k to 22k giving you a maximum frequency of 11k without sample rate conversion so ooh, i bet nobody remembers that it used to happen Th this is my air filter for brightening the idea was you'd be able to brighten to sort of try to fight that and then here's the demo timer and this lived just in the middle of everything and what i would do is if i was making like the demo i'd compile it like this and if i was not making the demo and i was compiling the version that i sold for 50 bucks boop I'd delete it, I'd compile again, and I'd put it back in and save. This was a little chunk of code that I could take out and put in any time I wanted. All I have to do is have the variable uh, demo timer sitting in there. And that would be enough. Let's not save that. Yeah, and you know about MindSpace that they used to chop the sample rate in half without processing or sample rate conversion? Oh, it made things nasty. Oh, it made things nasty. Yeah, so here, you can select a bunch, you can fi select files and use something like control F to find a line of code. What that gets you in trouble with is, say we do that, copy. Let's find what happens when we do sample plus noise shape, current shape index. And we'll hit Control F, and we'll find it. And there it is. And it's an array variable. Uh, and if we're trying to find out how this output sample makes its thing, let's say we do that. We copy, and we go. Where is noise shape dot bring the noise? find nothing showed up now if we look for bring the noise two matches that did find it yeah I know I, I won't be too long at I wasn't able to code a plugin today, so I thought I'd walk through some of this stuff. This is, this is what life is like for somebody learning to program plugins and stuff. It's all like this or worse. And the way I do it, it doesn't have to be, but people don't like programming in the old school style, so you get stuff like this. And I am able to find out where that went, but I would have to know that I was doing this, I was doing it on output sample equals a this, or it could be Fred or anything. Let's see, let's see what this does when I click this bit. Edit all in scope. Find it, this is what David was saying. Um, can't you select a bunch of files? You can do something like this. Find in project, jump to definition. That sounds good, let's define it. And it kind of did. This is C++ for you. This version clearly has some clue about how that stuff works. So you can do noise shape, noise shaper noise shape, or purest drive kernel noise shape. Well, I'm looking at purest drive kernel. Let's find that. And it opened the H file and showed me this. I don't actually know why it showed me that. It did, though. So purest... Uh, and that's because it's defined here, right? So noise shaper noise shape is what it went to find. It found where it was defined. Now, if I did that again, let's do that again. 
That was jumped to definition, so it was defined there, find in project. And we just opened that, and it shows me this. Purist Drive H, Class Noise Shaper, Float 36 Noise Shape 2, which is not the thing I'm talking about. Noise Shaper as a class, although I don't know if it's telling me whether that that's a that's simultaneously a class and a function within the class. And the definition of a instance of Noise Shaper. <laughs> then so if anybody knows great things about C++ and can correct me where I'm wrong here, that's probably useful because if I knew all of this stuff, I'd be able to code some of these things for myself rather than asking for help. But this is what I'm up against. Const output double equals noise shaping the noise, so it showed up there. And it showed up here, although it seems to be including noise shape as part of noise shape er. Yeah, see, I do that. It's selecting this word, but it's part of another word, noise shaper, which is close to the correct word, but not really the same one. And also, that's not the same as this array here. We've got the same word referring to two different things and being very close to a third thing. And then for some reason, we've got this part selected. Find noise shape. Noise shape apparently also is equal to part of the golden ratio. Let's not move that, shall we? And it is also apparently equal to this chunk of this. So we can find, see it's even showing me a little bit. The program will teach you what to do if it's designed well. So I was looking for noise shape to figure out what the heck this was about. And it told me it was a array of two float 64s. There's a class that's almost that, but not quite. There's an instance of the class that is that. See, this is literally what I was looking for. This is the one that I would have to know mattered. Then, Purist Drive uses this instance of this class with almost the same name, but not quite and applies it to output sample. So that's all well and good. And then this is not it. It's part of how it makes its variables. Um, this is not it. It's an entirely separate thing. Oh, don't do that. Now I'm really in trouble. It closed the window I was looking at. Um, well, gosh, let's go and make that, do that trick again. Find in project. Thank you. That's what I was trying to look at. So yeah, like I said, it was able to find this is the one that I'm supposed to know is what it does. And this is where it uses that instance of noise shaper that it defined. And then these are a different thing. I'm finding it, but it has nothing to do with what I was actually looking for. This is almost the same word, but not really. It also says that it's this chunk of code, clothing paren mod two re, and it also says that uh, noise shape is this. It's 0.618033988. Now what I'm supposed to make out of that, I really can't tell you. But it found it and it says, yeah, this, this is of interest to you. Also, if I tried to find it and replace it, I'd be replacing that. See if you watch to see if uh, you don't believe me. We're now re replacing it with oh no's. You're well, actually, I'm not sure what occurrence it is. I'm Let's find out. Uh, we just replaced it somewhere. But I don't know literally where. Okay, but how about undoing that? That seems like a bad idea. Yeah, 
It didn't update anything. How about textual? Options, all open projects. Uh, I'm gonna be careful not to hit save. <laughs> So now I'm looking at this, project files and frameworks, blah de blah. Do I have, if I hold down option, does it give me another replace? No. Display results in find smart group. And now it shows me nothing. So, options, no, replace. Do I really want to replace one out of 16? No, I wanted to replace all 16 because I knew that would be a big mess. But actually, that didn't work, and now I don't know where I am. So let us try to find Ono's, which I just told that it replaced. It can't find it. That's because... something changed. <laughs> Woof. Project find. Okay, this time, how about let's find Ono's. What, where did it change it? And the answer is it replaced it somewhere, but there's no telling where. I know, Ono's. Do we have a symbol of Ono's? Nope. So yeah. So I am here to tell you I have spent many, 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 many hours trying to help folks make little plugins for all uh, and getting stuck in jams like that for the purpose of trying to do things like, please, can you make me, can you help me by making a PC VST version of this? Or can we make this run on Big Sur or something like that? And it winds up just becoming that. It winds up becoming an enormous pile of mess. Let me close this and hope, yep, don't save. Oh goodness, don't save. The nice thing is I have actually managed to get through it some of the time. And uh, there will be other days when I'm coding stuff or making new algorithms, but you might find that I favor that old WebAssembly style thing. I tend to like the way that uh, code works when it's just kind of straightforward. Maybe not as primitive as that really early stuff. I showed you some code from back in like 2007 when I barely knew anything. And I did like all of my mathematical operations one at a time because I just kind of did. And uh, I grew up a lot beyond that, but the stuff I've been showing you uh, and one is too big of a challenge for the next coding streams. Like when I do coding for figuring out how to make the M1 work, and again, I've got a cup, I've asked somebody that I'm, I'm telling them I'm willing to pay them to walk through this stuff so that I can get a working version that I can start sort of doing my thing with and going 200 times to port all of my plugins over to whatever the new format is. The thing is, I can't just explore because you just saw what you get when you start exploring with the way people code C++ in the modern day. I think a lot of it is job protection. I think a lot of it is like, oh, we just do this like this because, hey, we can define classes. And don't you think that really belonged as its own like subclassable class of this in case you needed to expand it outwards elsewhere and, you know, I'm not the only person to object to that kind of stuff. Some people do that kind of stuff. If you're working, you know, at some kind of firm where you're doing the coding for them and you do stuff like that, they can never fire you because nobody else can code your code. That's part of it. But you've also got folks like Jonathan Blow 
and John Carmack, who are much more likely to code things in a very primitive way, like my early stuff that you saw, where it was like one math operation at a time. Back in the day, and I've watched a video stream of this, uh, uh, Jonathan Blow, who coded Braid, did a lecture on programming. There is no AU file type, but there is a audio unit 3, which I don't currently code. And I have to get my AU2s to compile in Big Sur and a new version of Xcode to get them to work in Big Sur. And that's the problem. I don't really need to be doing AU3s. I don't really need to be doing that. All I need to do is make my existing stuff compile on a newer machine with a newer version of Xcode. And that is so far removed from what I'm currently using that I've spent many, many hours doing exactly what, like you just saw. And that's what it's like. That's what it's like. So you've now experienced it with me, kind of. But yeah, back in the day, John Carmack released the code for Doom. And Jonathan Blow read it and went, this guy is a bozo. What the hell? He, he is reading in his entire like game save files as just a big chunk of objects. If you sorted it, you could read it much faster. I could do a simple quick sort or I could do a linked list of this and that and the other thing. And he came to understand, no, no, I was wrong. John Blow did. He came to understand, wait, I shouldn't be thinking about stuff like that when my job is to code a game. I need to be focusing on how the characters move or how to draw stuff to the screen, not how to save my stuff to a file in the most elegant, fancy way. Because any minute that I spend thinking on making the file save thing operate with a linked list so that I can gain like five milliseconds per load should be spent gaining five milliseconds per frame by coding the rendering better. So he came to decide that Carmack had it all worked out. And to agree with that approach of just doing some things that are not performance critical, that don't need to be abstracted in a really primitive way. You got to think like a computer rather than think like a smart programmer. Because the smart programmers are able to make everything so that any given piece of programming, any given class, any given function is just like three words. But the abstraction is pages and pages of... The abstraction is a maze. And the computer can do it. The computer can follow that stuff. But if a human can't follow that stuff, you're kind of defeating the purpose. So on that note, I think I'm going to go off and carry some firewood now because the great thing is now I have firewood, so my house is going to be warm for a little bit longer now. I didn't actually run out, not quite. And I got a whole pile of stuff to do. One of them is putting this into the Les Paul and setting things up so that next time I do a jam, rather than having it be purely electronic, I'd like to, when I was doing that jam last, I guess it was Saturday, it was Saturday, there were points in there where even though the chord progression was jumping around so wildly that it was almost as bad as giant steps, it was literally going across the chord chart from one place to another, I was getting pretty close to being able to play guitar over it and follow it because it was that fresh. Like I'd been like, okay, this goes here and this goes here and this is the point where it goes to this other area. And it would be fun to do some of that too. I'm not sure how easy it would be to transition from the tracking part to the mixing and overdubbing part, but uh, I'll see in a case. I'll talk to you folks later. Bye-bye.